Section twelve of To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part three. The Lighthouse. Chapter one. What does it mean then? What can it all mean? Lily Briscoe asked herself, wondering whether, since she had been left alone, it behoved her to go to the kitchen to fetch another cup of coffee or wait here. What does it mean? A catchword that was, caught up from some book, fitting her thought loosely, for she could not, this first morning with the Ramses, contract her feelings, could only make a phrase resound to cover the blankness of her mind until these vapours had shrunk. For really, what did she feel, come back after all these years and Mrs. Ramsay dead? Nothing, nothing, nothing that she could express at all. She had come late last night, when it was all mysterious, dark. Now she was awake, at her old place at the breakfast-table, but alone. It was very early, too, not yet eight. There was this expedition. They were going to the lighthouse, Mr. Ramsay, Cam, and James. They should have gone already. They had to catch the tide or something. And Cam was not ready, and James was not ready and Nancy had forgotten to order the sandwiches, and Mr. Ramsay had lost his temper and banged out of the room. "'What's the use of going now?' he had stormed. Nancy had vanished. There he was, marching up and down the terrace in a rage. One seemed to hear doors slamming and voices calling all over the house. Now Nancy burst in and asked, looking round the room, in a queer, half-dazed, half-desperate way, what does one send to the lighthouse?" As if she were forcing herself to do what she despaired of ever being able to do. What does one send to the lighthouse, indeed? At any other time Lily could have suggested reasonably tea, tobacco, newspapers. But this morning everything seemed so extraordinarily queer that a question like Nancy's, what does one send to the lighthouse? opened doors in one's mind that went banging and swinging to and fro, and made one keep asking, in a stupefied gape, what does one send, what does one do, why is one sitting here after all? Sitting alone, for Nancy went out again, among the clean cups at the long table, she felt cut off from other people, and able only to go on watching, asking, wondering. The house the place, the morning, all seemed strangers to her. She had no attachment here, she felt, no relations with it. Anything might happen, and whatever did happen—a step outside, a voice calling, "'It's not in the cupboard, it's on the landing,' someone cried, was a question, as if the link that usually bound things together had been cut, and they floated up here, down there, off, anyhow. How aimless it was, how chaotic, how unreal it was, she thought, looking at her empty coffee-cup. Mrs. Ramsay dead, Andrew killed, Prue dead too. Repeated as she might, it roused no feeling in her. And we all get together in a house like this on a morning like this, she said, looking out of the window. It was a beautiful still day. Chapter Two. Suddenly Mr. Ramsay raised his head as he passed, and looked straight at her, with his distraught, wild gaze which was yet so penetrating, as if he saw you, for one second, for the first time, for ever. And she pretended to drink out of her empty coffee-cup, so as to escape him, to escape his demand on her, to put aside a moment longer that imperious need. And he shook his head at her and strode on. Alone, she heard him say. Perished, she heard him say. And like everything else this strange morning, the words became symbols, wrote themselves all over the grey-green walls. If only she could put them together, she felt, write them out in some sentence, then she would have got at the truth of things. Old Mr. Carmichael came padding softly in, fetched his coffee, took his cup and made off to sit in the sun. The extraordinary unreality was frightening, but it was also exciting. Going to the lighthouse. 
but what does one send to the lighthouse? Perished, alone, the grey-green light on the wall opposite, the empty places. Such were some of the parts, but how bring them together? she asked. As if any interruption would break the frail shape she was building on the table, she turned her back to the window, lest Mr. Ramsay should see her. She must escape somewhere, be alone somewhere. Suddenly she remembered. When she had sat there last, ten years ago, there had been a little sprig or leaf-pattern on the tablecloth, which she had looked at in a moment of revelation. There had been a problem about a foreground of a picture. Move the tree to the middle, she had said. She had never finished that picture. She would paint that picture now. It had been knocking about in her mind all these years. Where were her paints? she wondered. Her paints, yes. She had left them in the hall last night. She would start at once. She got up quickly, before Mr. Ramsay turned. She fetched herself a chair. She pitched her easel with her precise, old-maidish movements on the edge of the lawn, not too close to Mr. Carmichael, but close enough for his protection. Yes, it must have been precisely here that she had stood ten years ago. There was the wall, the hedge, the tree. The question was of some relation between those masses. She had borne it in her mind all these years. It seemed as if the solution had come to her. She knew now what she wanted to do. But with Mr. Ramsay bearing down on her, she could do nothing. Every time he approached, he was walking up and down the terrace, ruin approached, chaos approached. She could not paint. She stooped. She turned. She took up this rag. She squeezed that tube. But all she did was to ward him off for a moment. He made it impossible for her to do anything. For if she gave him the least chance, if he saw her disengaged a moment, looking his way a moment, he would be on her, saying, as he had said last night, "'You find us much changed.' Last night he had got up and stopped before her, and said that. Dumb and staring though they had all sat, the six children whom they used to call after the kings and queens of England, the red, the fair, the wicked, the ruthless, she felt how they raged under it. Kind old Mrs. Beckwith said something sensible. But it was a house full of unrelated passions. She had felt that all the evening. And on top of this chaos, Mr. Ramsay got up, pressed her hand, and said, "'You will find us much changed.' And none of them had moved or had spoken, but had sat there as if they were forced to let him say it. Only James— certainly the sullen, scowled at the lamp, and Cam screwed her handkerchief round her finger. Then he reminded them that they were going to the lighthouse to-morrow. They must be ready, in the hall, on the stroke of half-past seven. Then, with his hand on the door, he stopped. He turned upon them. Did they not want to go? he demanded. Had they dared say no? He had some reason for wanting it. He would have flung himself tragically backwards into the bitter waters of despair. Such a gift he had for gesture! He looked like a king in exile. Doggedly, James said yes. Cam stumbled more wretchedly. Yes, oh yes, they'd both be ready, they said. And it struck her, this was tragedy. Not Paul's, dust and the shroud, but children coerced their spirits subdued. James was sixteen, Cam seventeen, perhaps. She had looked round for someone who was not there, for Mrs. Ramsay, presumably. But there was only kind Mrs. Beckwith, turning over her sketches under the lamp. Then, being tired, her mind still rising and falling with the sea, the taste and smell that places have after long absence possessing her, the candles wavering in her eyes. She had lost herself and gone under. It was a wonderful night, starlit. The waves sounded as they went upstairs. The moon surprised them, enormous, pale, as they passed the staircase window. She had slept at once.
she set her clean canvas firmly upon the easel, as a barrier, frail, but she hoped sufficiently substantial to ward off Mr. Ramsay and his exactingness. She did her best to look, when his back was turned, at her picture, that line there, that mass there. But it was out of the question. Let him be fifty feet away, let him not even speak to you, let him not even see you. He permeated, he prevailed, he imposed himself. He changed everything. She could not see the colour, she could not see the lines. Even with his back turned to her, she could only think, but he'll be down on me in a moment, demanding. Something she felt she could not give him. She rejected one brush, she chose another. When would those children come? When would they all be off? she fidgeted. That man, she thought, her anger rising in her, never gave, that man took. She, on the other hand, would be forced to give. Mrs. Ramsay had given. Giving, giving, giving she had died, and had left all this. Really, she was angry with Mrs. Ramsay. With the brush slightly trembling in her fingers, she looked at the hedge, the step, the wall. It was all Mrs. Ramsay's doing. She was dead. Here was Lily, at forty-four, wasting her time, unable to do a thing, standing there, playing at painting, playing at the one thing one did not play at, and it was all Mrs. Ramsay's fault. She was dead. The step where she used to sit was empty. She was dead. But why repeat this over and over again? Why be always trying to bring up some feeling she had not got? There was a kind of blasphemy in it. It was all dry, all withered, all spent. They ought not to have asked her. She ought not to have come. One can't waste one's time at forty-four, she thought. She hated playing at painting. A brush, the one dependable thing in a world of strife, ruin, chaos, that one should not play with, knowingly even. She detested it. But he made her. You shan't touch your canvas, he seemed to say, bearing down on her, till you've given me what I want of you. Here he was, close upon her again, greedy, distraught. Well, thought Lily in despair, letting her right hand fall at her side. It would be simpler then to have it over. Surely she could imitate from recollection the glow, the rhapsody, the self-surrender she had seen on so many women's faces. On Mrs. Ramsay's, for instance. When on some occasion like this they blazed up, she could remember the look on Mrs. Ramsay's face, into a rapture of sympathy, of delight in the reward they had, which, though the reason of it escaped her, evidently conferred on them the most supreme bliss of which human nature was capable. Here he was, stopped by her side. She would give him what she could. CHAPTER Three. She seemed to have shrivelled slightly, he thought. She looked a little skimpy, wispy, but not unattractive. He liked her. There had been some talk of her marrying William Banks once, but nothing had come of it. His wife had been fond of her. He had been a little out of temper, too, at breakfast. And then, and then, this was one of those moments when an enormous need urged him, without being conscious what it was, to approach any woman, to force them, he did not care how, his need was so great, to give him what he wanted, sympathy. Was anybody looking after her, he said, had she everything she wanted? Oh, thanks, everything," said Lily Briscoe nervously. No, she could not do it. She ought to have floated off instantly upon some wave of sympathetic expansion. The pressure on her was tremendous. But she remained stuck. There was an awful pause. They both looked at the sea. Why, thought Mr. Ramsay, should she look at the sea when I am here? She hoped it would be calm enough for them to land at the lighthouse, she said. 
The lighthouse! The lighthouse! What's that got to do with it?" he thought impatiently. Instantly, with the force of some primeval gust, for really he could not restrain himself any longer, there issued from him such a groan that any other woman in the whole world would have done something, said something. All except myself, thought Lily, girding at herself bitterly, who am not a woman, but a peevish, ill-tempered, dried-up old maid, presumably. Mr. Ramsay sighed to the full. He waited. Was she not going to say anything? Did she not see what he wanted from her? Then he said he had a particular reason for wanting to go to the lighthouse. His wife used to send the men things. There was a poor boy with a tuberculous hip, the lightkeeper's son. He sighed profoundly. He sighed significantly. All Lily wished was that this enormous flood of grief, this insatiable hunger for sympathy, this demand that she should surrender herself up to him entirely, and even so he had sorrows enough to keep her supplied for ever, should leave her, should be diverted. She kept looking at the house, hoping for an interruption, before it swept her down in its flow. Such expeditions, said Mr. Ramsay, scraping the ground with his toe, are very painful. Still Lily said nothing. She is a stock, she is a stone, he said to himself. They are very exhausting, he said, looking, with a sickly look that nauseated her. He was acting, she felt, this great man was dramatizing himself. At his beautiful hands. It was horrible, it was indecent. Would they never come, she asked, for she could not sustain this enormous weight of sorrow, support these heavy draperies of grief. He had assumed a pose of extreme decrepitude. He even tottered a little as he stood there, a moment longer. Still she could say nothing. The whole horizon seemed swept bare of objects to talk about. Could only feel, amazedly, as Mr. Ramsay stood there, how his gaze seemed to fall dolefully over the sunny grass and discolour it, and cast over the rubicund, drowsy, entirely contented figure of Mr. Carmichael, reading a French novel on a deck-chair, a veil of crape, as if such an existence, flaunting its prosperity in a world of woe, were enough to provoke the most dismal thoughts of all. "'Look at him,' he seemed to be saying, "'look at me!' And indeed all the time he was feeling, think of me, think of me. Ah, could that bulk only be wafted alongside of them, Lily wished. Had she only pitched her easel a yard or two closer to him, a man, any man, would staunch this effusion, would stop these lamentations. A woman, she had provoked this horror. A woman, she should have known how to deal with it. It was immensely to her discredit, sexually, to stand there dumb. One said, what did one say? Oh, Mr. Ramsay, dear Mr. Ramsay! That was what that kind old lady who sketched, Mrs. Beckwith, would have said, instantly and rightly. But no. They stood there, isolated from the rest of the world. His immense self-pity, his demand for sympathy poured and spread itself in pools at her feet, and all she did, miserable sinner that she was, was to draw her skirts a little closer round her ankles, lest she should get wet. In complete silence she stood there, grasping her paintbrush. Heaven could never be sufficiently praised. She heard sounds in the house. James and Cam must be coming. But Mr. Ramsay, as if he knew that his time ran short, exerted upon her solitary figure the immense pressure of his concentrated woe, his age, his frailty, his desolation, when suddenly, tossing his head impatiently, in his annoyance, for after all what woman could resist him, he noticed that his bootlaces were untied. Remarkable boots they were, too, Lily thought, looking down at them, sculptured colossal, like everything that Mr. Ramsay wore, 
from his frayed tie to his half-buttoned waistcoat, his own indisputably. She could see them walking to his room of their own accord, expressive in his absence of pathos, surliness, ill-temper, charm. "'What beautiful boots!' she exclaimed. She was ashamed of herself. To praise his boots when he asked her to solace his soul, when he had shown her his bleeding hands, his lacerated heart, and asked her to pity them, then to say, cheerfully, "'Ah, but what beautiful boots you wear!' deserved, she knew, and she looked up expecting to get it in one of his sudden roars of ill-temper, complete annihilation. Instead, Mr. Ramsay smiled. His pall, his draperies, his infirmities fell from him. Ah, yes, he said, holding his foot up for her to look at. They were first-rate boots. There was only one man in England who could make boots like that. Boots are among the chief curses of mankind, he said. Bootmakers make it their business, he exclaimed, to cripple and torture the human foot. They are also the most obstinate and perverse of mankind. It had taken him the best part of his youth to get boots made as they should be made. He would have her observe, he lifted his right foot and then his left, that she had never seen boots made quite that shape before. They were made of the finest leather in the world, also. Most leather was mere brown paper and cardboard. He looked complacently at his foot, still held in the air. They had reached, she felt, a sunny island where peace dwelt, sanity reigned, and the sun for ever shone, the blessed island of good boots. Her heart warmed to him. "'Now let me see if you can tie a knot,' he said. He pooh-poohed her feeble system. He showed her his own invention. Once you tied it, it never came undone. Three times he knotted her shoe, three times he unknotted it. Why, at this completely inappropriate moment, when he was stooping over her shoe, should she be so tormented with sympathy for him that, as she stooped too, the blood rushed to her face, and, thinking of her callousness, she had called him a play-actor, she felt her eyes swell and tingle with tears. Thus occupied, he seemed to her a figure of infinite pathos. He tied knots, he bought boots. There was no helping Mr. Ramsay on the journey he was going. But now, just as she wished to say something, could have said something, perhaps, here they were, Cam and James. They appeared on the terrace. They came lagging, side by side, a serious, melancholy couple. But why was it like that that they came? She could not help feeling annoyed with them. They might have come more cheerfully. They might have given him what, now that they were off, she would not have the chance of giving him. For she felt a sudden emptiness, a frustration. Her feeling had come too late. There it was, ready, but he no longer needed it. He had become a very distinguished, elderly man, who had no need of her whatsoever. She felt a snubbed. He slung a knapsack round his shoulders. He shared out the parcels. There were a number of them, ill-tied in brown paper. He sent Cam for a cloak. He had all the appearance of a leader making ready for an expedition. Then, wheeling about, he led the way with his firm military tread, in those wonderful boots, carrying brown paper parcels, down the path, his children following him. They looked, she thought, as if fate had devoted them to some stern enterprise, and they went to it, still young enough to be drawn acquiescent in their father's wake, obediently, but with a pallor in their eyes, which made her feel that they suffered something beyond their years in silence. So they passed the edge of the lawn, and it seemed to Lily that she watched a procession go by, drawn on by some stress of common feeling, which made it, faltering and flagging as it was, a little company bound together, and strangely impressive to her. Politely, but very distantly, 
Mr. Ramsay raised his hand and saluted her as they passed. But what a face, she thought, immediately finding the sympathy which she had not been asked to give, troubling her for expression. What had made it like that? Thinking, night after night, she supposed, about the reality of kitchen tables, she added, remembering the symbol which in her vagueness as to what Mr. Ramsay did think about, Andrew had given her. He had been killed by the splinter of a shell instantly, she bethought her. The kitchen table was something visionary, austere, something bare, hard, not ornamental. There was no colour to it, it was all edges and angles, it was uncompromisingly plain. But Mr. Ramsay kept always his eyes fixed upon it, never allowed himself to be distracted or deluded, until his face became worn too, and ascetic, and partook of this unornamented beauty which so deeply impressed her. Then she recalled, standing where he had left her, holding her brush, worries had fretted it, not so nobly. He must have had his doubts about that table, she supposed, whether the table was a real table, whether it was worth the time he gave to it, whether he was able, after all, to find it. He had had doubts, she felt, or he would have asked less of people. That was what they talked about late at night sometimes, she suspected, and then next day Mrs. Ramsay looked tired, and Lily flew into a rage with him over some absurd little thing. But now he had nobody to talk to about that table, or his boots, or his knots, and he was like a lion seeking whom he could devour, and his face had that touch of desperation, of exaggeration in it, which alarmed her, and made her pull her skirts about her. And then, she recalled, there was that sudden revivification, that sudden flare, when she praised his boots, that sudden recovery of vitality and interest in ordinary human things, which too passed and changed, for he was always changing and hid nothing, into that other final phase which was new to her, and had, she owned, made herself ashamed of her own irritability when it seemed as if he had shed worries and ambitions, and the hope of sympathy and the desire for praise, had entered some other region, was drawn on, as if by curiosity, in dumb colloquy, whether with himself or another, at the head of that little procession out of one's range. An extraordinary face. The gate banged. End of section 12